welcome back at ECMID TV, brought to you live from Pavilion 1 at the 32nd ECMID Congress. We are here in Lisbon, Portugal, bringing this live to you. And I'm very, very excited to be introducing you to my next guest here on my sofa in the ECMID TV studio, which is Professor Alison Holmes. Um, I, well, not right for I, uh, she corrected me because um, when I was when I was uh, wrapping up our, our last broadcast, I said that she was a keynote lecturer, but of course she is not holding a keynote lecture, but she is actually doing one of the new formats this year, a keynote scientific interview, and uh, she will be doing a kind keynote scientific interview from 1.30 to 2.30 tomorrow um, in Hall A with. Um, Mary Horgan as your interviewer. So she'll actually be doing something I think so quite similar to what we will be doing today when we will be talking a little bit um, about the topics you're going to be discussing tomorrow. Um, the title of the interview is Never Let an Outbreak Go to Waste. How COVID-19 has changed hospital epidemiology and infection prevention and control. It, I think I think it sounds interesting. <laughs> I agree. I think so. I think Judith, it's really interesting. I'm delighted that that topic has been picked. Yeah. I think it really lends itself to discussion. Yeah. I mean, this is the first time that ECMID is um, using a format like that, a, yeah. a kind of interview and much more discursive. So it's going to be a real first. So it's um, I think Evelina Tacanelli and I are the first people to do this um, type of interview at ECMID. Um, I'm really delighted that I'm going to be doing it with Mary Horgan, who is yes. the president of the Royal College of Physicians of Ireland. Yeah. Um, and I hope we're going to have a, quite a bit of to and fro and yeah. discussion about mutual experience. And I think it really lends itself to discussion rather than a kind of formal um, lecture, although I'm going to be giving a formal lecture um, later on um, in ECMID. And I think there are many, many aspects to pick up in terms of learning points, huge opportunities in terms of, of adopting innovation and really, really harnessing the learning and also public awareness of infection, transmission, um, testing, etc. So we could perhaps really get behind um, some of the learning to make a real change in how we address infection prevention, um, safer health care, um, and also how we use antimicro uh, antimicrobials. And I think the other thing in terms of um, policy and how we look at healthcare, the impact of COVID on our elective patients and the massive backlog. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure the Netherlands yeah. is experiencing the Absolutely. same thing. Yeah. So we need to think about our non-COVID patients as well as our COVID patients. And, yeah. and the learning and the legacy around COVID has to include how do we manage um, the recovery of healthcare, yeah. and how do we look after our vulnerable patients um, when we're, our healthcare systems are so stretched, and the delays in procedures or, or cancer treatments yeah. or surgery have been so do you, profound. Do you feel that the learnings that we, we have made um, after these, these two years of pandemic, have they led to concrete plans for the future? I think that's Or are we not there yet? No, we need to absolutely make the most of it and really address some of these things so we do not miss out from adoptions of new technologies, from data linkage to also how we can use um, uh, clinical trials much more pragmatically um, to get the best evidence for how we can treat things to how we can use the public much more effectively. Yeah, and, communication. And absolutely, yeah. And, and work without laboratories sorry, not work without laboratories, but bring much more to point of care and integrating data into surveillance. Yeah. I mean, those are just a few things, but I also think one of the areas about is about looking after our staff and also making um, mm. hospitals safer places. I mean, yeah. it's... For everyone. Yeah, yeah, we should not need COVID to do that, yeah. but it really raises the bar in terms of attention on how we keep healthcare safe for patients, for staff, and of course the patients are the non-COVID patients. Um, and I think we were probably a little bit slow on, on doing that. Yeah. yeah. What would you say that COVID-19, what was the biggest change in hospital epidemiology due to COVID-19? 
So I think um, so. So it's I think it's ironic that you know so much about modeling, so much about modeling data and data. But meanwhile, yeah. within healthcare, a lot of data collection and surveillance and monitoring was slightly compromised. And it's absolutely critical that we have that information there. Um, I think there's also huge amounts of learning in terms of how we manage safe systems and how we look after staff as well. Um, so so um, I think we're only just beginning to make, you know, implement and make those effective. Yeah. But I think it's a kind of unique moment for us to make sure that we don't forget the learning and we start embedding yeah. it. And, and you know, Do you think they're acceptance. applicable to all the European countries uh, here visiting? And even there are a lot of people from countries outside of Europe here visiting ECMID, but I, does oh, everyone, can everyone put these learnings to use uh, well, for their own personal or personal professional situation? Well, I, th I think one thing is universal, which is about public awareness yeah. and pa not just patient awareness, public awareness, people discussing home testing, people, you know, understanding. I mean, we were talking earlier about the issues about viral transmission and everything, that there's much more public awareness, citizen yeah. science, et cetera. We should yeah. be making the most of, uh, you know, the public now engaged and being absolutely part of it, supporting the type of trials we need to do, supporting the type of, uh, of data we may need to get, supporting the need for screening and how we can use diagnostics to protect patients, protect them, and not just for COVID, but for resistant organisms, etc. And then, so you, you mentioned thinking of non-European countries. So I, I also want to um, talk about the opportunities in um, lower resource settings. And this is something very dear to me. I'm the current president of the International Society of Infectious Diseases. And the issues around equity um, in yeah. terms of access, yeah. um, as well as in terms of management, and as well as how we learn together, is absolutely critical. And I think there's a kind of, um, there's also been a fundamental shift, I think, in recognizing how critical it is that we collaborate and we share learning. And I think yeah. ECMID is very valuable for that. But we have got the most extraordinary ex expertise in different parts of the world, whether they're low resource settings or not, there is extraordinary expertise. And we need to be learning from those networks and from yeah. the people at the front line of those networks that are leading the most extraordinary science, but it may not be in a high income setting, but they are leading the most extraordinary science and have the most extraordinary frontline experience. And we really need to be learning from them. Yeah, well, we're, we're giving, or we're, ECMID is giving you a big platform to Absolutely. share all these learnings. So I Absolutely. think the, the keynote scientific interview tomorrow, please check it out. If you have the time and the availability tomorrow at 1.30, um, that will be in Hall A. Um, um, the keynote um, scientific interview will take place where you will be interviewed by Mary Horgan. Um, or rather having a very nice scientific dialogue on these matters. And tomorrow also at three o'clock, you will be leading or hosting um, a fireplace session <laughs> in which you will be also making all this, uh, this information and experience and expertise available to, well, some younger investigators mm -hmm. or, or, or people with an interested mind. Um, uh, is that important for you to, to be able to exchange that also with well, oh. not just the, the large uh, uh, populations uh, of, of interest. Yeah, that, that's, um, that, that's really critical uh, to me, Judith. I mean, I, but, but I have to say I'm slightly nervous. <laughs> I'm slightly nervous about two, uh, two new formats. New, two <laughs> new formats. I have no idea about it. Anyway, if people are kind and gentle and we'll muddle our way through, I'm sure it'll be fine. But yeah, um, we'll, we'll find a way. But no, absolutely um, critical. Um, so. And I, you know, the role ECMID has in supporting young clinicians, young scientists, researchers is just amazing. And and the, it, you know, and an event like this is so important in terms of recognizing yep. the work, no matter where you are in your career. And it's just fantastic. Whether or not the, my far place session is any use is another thing. But the the, the yeah. platform of ECMID is so valuable. And I'm, you know, 
I was so delighted. So this morning, um, one of my younger colleagues got a Young Investigator Award, Tim Rawson, yeah. and it was such a delight. It was just so fantastic to see that. And, and to have young investigators be recognized is just brilliant. So yeah, I, I'm not quite sure how the far side session will go, but I'm looking forward to it. And it's also great to meet younger people. Um, they're all inspiring and phenomenally clever and terribly committed that it's quite scary. Yeah, and it's still, it's such an evolving field, the field of clinical microbiology, infectious diseases. Completely. With old viruses, new pathogens. Yeah. I mean, it's a... Uh, it's really uh, exciting well, time. I, I, I believe one of the most dynamic fields uh, there is. Uh, so, yeah, it, it makes sense yeah, to me as an outsider to uh, yeah, It'll involve be all the levels of expertise. I also yeah. think, you know, going back to what you're asking about COVID, I mean, I wonder how much that will encourage I mean, in terms of attracting um, new investigators, new clinicians, new scientists. Mm. In this field. Yeah. Do you, mm. I mean, so will people just be so tired? Do you or have will experience they be inspired? with this? No, or but I'm, I'm, I'm just concern. wondering. I'm just yeah. wondering, you know, will you know, there be budding scientists and clinicians coming through? Or will they be thinking, oh, mm. my goodness. We saw all the burnouts from all the clinicians and the... And so yeah. we're going to change that. Yeah, well, that's something we'll have to have to really Address. keep an eye on no, that, we'll I guess. We'll inspire them all. This yeah. is the place to be. This is the place. This the is where you're going to do it. So you also told me that on Monday you'll, you'll be giving um, a true lecture, <laughs> not in an interview yeah. form, but in a, a format, but in, in a lecture format. Yeah. And you'll be doing that on the impact of COVID on antibiotic prescribing. Yeah. yeah. So just in a nutshell, just maybe as a teaser for our viewers to come watch that lecture as well. Um, what is the impact of COVID-19 on so antibiotic prescribing? I, um, so of course the teaser is come on Monday. <laughs> but no, if there's anybody left here and um, not heard, sick and tired of hearing me, that, but it's a really, it's a really good imagine. session. It's a really important aspect. Um, it's not an easy answer. So um, antibiotic use went up extraordinarily, largely in intensive care units. But actually, if you look across all of healthcare, it's gone down a huge amount in primary care. And Some this of is in is the good. UK? Or? No, this is, this is um, um, broader than the UK. So European data, um, US and Canadian data. Sadly, though, at the moment, you know, we are talking about needing, needing um, to work with um, uh, low resource settings. There's not yet enough data there, but there's some really interesting aspects of, of care being compromised in terms of vaccine delivery in the community, oh, HIV yeah. management in the community, TB management in the community. So whilst there may be some really good things about, oh, antibiotic use going down the community, actually, it may be that we needed those antibiotics to be used in some case, in, in many cases. So it's, it's a complex, we'll, we'll, see what, we'll see what happens, but certainly big increases in intensive care unit, that's settling down, but in the, um, in the broader community, it's gone down. And what that means needs a little bit more analysis and thinking through. Yeah. Do you think we're, or do you expect that we're going to get all these insights? Because I think well, there's we, never been, um, so well, in our lives, uh, such a huge interference that's completely healthcare changing as, as this pandemic was. That's, uh, you know, and if yeah. we miss this opportunity to not learn from it by not setting things up to learn about yeah. the impact, we'll be missing a massive opportunity for society not to learn from this. So it's really important that we understand um, uh, we, we understand what's going on and, the, um, uh, and also the unintended consequences and some of the indirect yeah. aspects. And it, it links also to um, access to general practice, antibiotic Absolutely. use in the community, uh, how telemedicine was used and how community practices were closed down. So yeah. there, is, there, there may be some pretty uh, you know, worrying unintended consequences instead of everybody thinking, oh, hurrah, uh, antibiotic use has gone down. So, so that needs a bit more um, um, investigation. Attention. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, well, to stay in your words, um, <laughs> it's a massive opportunity to, um, uh, yeah, to hear, um, to, 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 
yeah, to access these learnings that yeah. um, experts in the field um, have made ready for you. So for our viewers, I would like to invite you all to really come and, uh, and, and uh, attend the keynote scientific interview with Professor Alison Holmes tomorrow at 1.30. Um, the fireplace session, they are already pre-registered, so uh, most likely these are full. Um, enjoy it if you have the opportunity to have a fireplace session with Professor Alison Holmes. Um, I would like to thank you, uh, Alison, for coming here and taking the time for, well, to tease us a little bit about what we're going to be hearing from you this ECMID. And for our viewers, thank you so much for tuning in again uh, to hear us uh, discuss this some, somewhat more. Um, and we will be back with you in another hour, and we will be doing our last broadcast for today. Then at 5 o'clock sharp, we will be talking with Dr. Suchi Tsaria, who is also a keynote speaker. So um, I would love to welcome you back then. See you then at 5.